Hi, Jeannie. How's it going? Oh, hello, Dan. Pretty well, thanks. Have you managed to get the money for the course yet? Yes, that's all sorted out now, thanks. It took long enough, though. It was practically a year ago that I applied to my local council for a grant, and it took them six months to turn me down. That's really slow. And I thought I was eligible for government funding, but it seems I was mistaken. So then I asked the boss of the company I used to work for if they would sponsor me, and much to my surprise, he said they'd make a contribution. But what about college grants and scholarships? There must be some you could apply for. Yes, there are, but they're all so small that I decided to leave them until I was desperate. Uh -huh. And in fact, I didn't need to apply. My parents had been saying that as I already had a job, I ought to support myself through college. But in the end, they took pity on me, so now I've just about got enough. That's good. <laughs> so now I can put a bit of effort into meeting people. Haven't had time so far. Any suggestions? What about joining some college clubs? Oh, right. You joined several, didn't you? Yes. I'm in the drama club. It's our first performance next week, so we're rehearsing frantically. <laughs> and I've got behind with my work. But it's worth it. I'm hoping to be in the spring production, too. Mm. I've never liked acting. Are you doing anything else? I enjoyed singing when I was at school, so I joined a group when I came to college. I don't think the conductor stretches us enough, though, so I'll give up after the next concert. And I also joined the debating society. It's fun, but with all the rehearsing I'm doing, something has to go, and I'm afraid that's the one. Do you do any sports? Yes. I'm in one of the hockey teams. I'm not very good, but I'd really miss it if I stopped. I decided to try tennis when I came to college, and I'm finding it pretty tough going. I'm simply not fit enough. <laughs> Nor me. I think I'll give that a miss. I'm hoping it'll help me to build up my stamina, but it'll probably be a long haul. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> Thanks. How are you finding the course? I wish we had more seminars. What? I'd have thought we had more than enough already. All those people saying clever things that I could never think of. It's quite interesting, but I wonder if I'm clever enough to be doing this course. I find it helpful to listen to the other people. I like the way we're exploring the subject and working towards getting insight into it. How do you get on with your tutor? I don't think I'm on the same wavelength as mine, so I feel I'm not getting anything out of the tutorials. It would be more productive to read a book instead. Oh, mine's very demanding. She gives me lots of feedback and advice, so I've got much better at writing essays. And she's helping me plan my revision for the end-of-year exams. Do tell me. I always struggle with revision. Well, the first thing is to find out exactly what's required in the exams. Hmm. Would it help to get hold of some past papers? Yes. They'll help to make it clear. Right, I'll do that. Then what? Then you can sort out your revision priorities, based on what's most likely to come up. I put these on a card and read them through regularly. Uh-huh. But that isn't enough in itself. You also need a timetable to see how you can fit everything in, in the time available. Then keep it in front of you while you're studying. I've done that before, but it hasn't helped me. Maybe you need to do something different every day. So if you break down your revision into small tasks and allocate them to specific days, there's more incentive to tackle them. With big topics, you're more likely to put off starting. Mm, good idea. And as I revise each topic, I write a single paragraph about it. Then later I can read it through quickly and it helps fix things in my mind. Oh, that's brilliant. I also write answers to questions for the exam practice. It's hard to make myself do it, though. <laughs> well, I'll try. Thanks a lot, Jeannie. That's a great help. No problem. See you around. Bye. Good morning, everyone. I've been invited to talk about my research project into Australian Aboriginal rock paintings. The Australian Aborigines have recorded both real and symbolic images of their time on rock walls for many thousands of years. Throughout the long history of this tradition, new images have appeared and new painting styles have developed. And these characteristics can be used to categorise the different artistic styles. Among these are what we call the dynamic, yam and modern styles of painting. 
One of the most significant characteristics of the different styles is the way that humans are depicted in the paintings. The more recent paintings show people in static poses, but the first human images to dominate rock art paintings over 8,000 years ago were full of movement. These paintings showed people hunting and cooking food, and so they were given the name dynamic to reflect this energy. It's quite amazing considering they were painted in such a simple stick-like form. In the Yam period, there was a movement away from stick figures to a more naturalistic shape. However, they didn't go as far as the modern style, which is known as X-ray because it actually makes a feature of the internal skeleton as well as the organs of animals and humans. The Yam style of painting got its name from the fact that it featured much curvier figures that actually resemble the vegetable called a yam, which is similar to a sweet potato. The modern paintings are interesting because they include paintings at the time of the first contact with European settlers. Aborigines managed to convey the idea of the settlers' clothing by simply painting the Europeans without any hands, indicating the habit of standing with their hands in their pockets. Size is another characteristic. The more recent images tend to be life-size or even larger, but the dynamic figures are painted in miniature. Aboriginal rock art also records the environmental changes that occurred over thousands of years. For example, we know from the dynamic paintings that over 8,000 years ago, Aborigines would have rarely eaten fish and sea levels were much lower at this time. In fact, Fish didn't start to appear in paintings until the Yam period, along with shells and other marine images. The paintings of the Yam tradition also suggest that, during this time, the Aborigines moved away from animals as their main food source and began including vegetables in their diet, as these feature prominently. Freshwater creatures didn't appear in the paintings until the modern period from 4,000 years ago. So these paintings have already taught us a lot. But one image that has always intrigued us is known as the Rainbow Serpent. The Rainbow Serpent, which is the focus of my most recent project, gets its name from its snake or serpent-like body and it first appeared in the Yam period four to 6,000 years ago. Many believe it is a curious mixture of kangaroo, snake and crocodile but we decided to study the Rainbow Serpent paintings to see if we could locate the animal that the very first painters based their image on. The Yam period coincided with the end of the last ice age. This brought about tremendous change in the environment, with the sea levels rising and creeping steadily inland. This flooded many familiar land features and also caused a great deal of disruption to traditional patterns of life, hunting in particular. New shores were formed and totally different creatures would have washed up onto the shores. We studied 107 paintings of the rainbow serpent and found that the one creature that matches it most closely was the ribboned pipefish, which is a type of seahorse. This sea creature would have been a totally unfamiliar sight in the inland regions where the image is found and it may have been the inspiration behind the early paintings. So... At the end of the Ice Age, there would have been enormous changes in animal and plant life. It's not surprising, then, that the Aborigines linked this abundance to the new creatures they witnessed. Even today, Aborigines see the rainbow serpent as a symbol of creation, which is understandable given the increase in vegetation and the new life forms that featured when the image first appeared.